perfect segue. So we're going to move into the open forum. And Michael, as you said, this this really is a start um, from the board's perspective. Um, our plan here is uh, for uh, Jonathan Leah to lead us in this discussion. We've put um, 35 minutes on the agenda, um, but we're going to start early. So you might even have 40 minutes if you need it. Um, this will be followed up if there's further questions. I think we've planned that they could come back in August if, if necessary, but then um, the follow-up planned with um, community education as we go into September and really um, to do as much as we can to uh, educate folks. So Michael, exactly what, what you said and I appreciate the Finance Committee um, being here but also uh, taking it on on your side. And I would just uh, encourage um, residents, taxpayers, um, business owners, et cetera, with any questions or uh, comments to uh, share those with us as we move forward, because this really is about um, hoping to get everybody on the same page, educate uh, folks as we um, kind of what tax classification is, the roles folks play, and, and really uh, help people better understand um, as we approach our tax classification hearing uh, later this fall. So with that, Jonathan. Floor is yours. Can I Oops. just add, sorry, uh, I just wanted to add kind of the, the timeline and kind of where this came from is that uh, at the board's retreat, we talked about the need for some education around tax classification. So it was not only a goal of the board to, um, to put education materials out to the community, but also a goal that you had created for me. So um, this, as, as we've said, this is the first of multiple um, presentations and our expectation is that in September we would do a more public forum type uh, meeting where we could have some um, some other questions and some presentations perhaps uh, from the community. So, great, thank you, Christy. The floor is yours. Hello there, board members. Thank you for having me. My name is Jonathan Steinberg. I uh, act as your chief assessor, um, and tonight's goal is to, as you mentioned, educate uh, yourselves and the public about tax classification. Uh, the focus really is to break it down and simplify it. As I've been told when I present and talk frequently, it is not so simple. So hopefully tonight uh, I'll be able to do just that. Um, the primary goal tonight is to understand that there are two key factors that need to be known before you can even get to your tax classification hearing and do any sort of consideration analysis as to what those numbers are going to be. The first is the levy and the second is the value. And it's those two key factors that go into the math that's gonna determine what your tax rate is. So tonight, we're gonna to define what that levy is and what that term means. It is the amount to be raised, and we'll get to that in a minute. We're gonna understand what classification is as it relates to property. Um, the apportionment of the levy between the residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property as the types of property and the role of the select board when it comes to the classification hearing, the shift of the levy, the residential exemption, the small commercial exemption, the decisions that are made at the classification hearing. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I did receive all of your questions. Some will be answered tonight. Some may go beyond the depth of this evening, at which point we can follow up in uh, other ways, or if you have questions, you'll let me know. So the levy. The definition of the levy, the total amount to be raised by a community through real and personal property taxes. For most communities, this is their largest source of revenue. Okay, The levy is the amount to be raised after local receipts. So you determine all of the amounts that need to be raised for a year. So at town meeting, you go, you vote, and you say we need to raise and appropriate certain funds for certain things and you end up at the end of the year with the total amount that needs to be raised. And that includes state charges and other expenses including the overlay. From that total amount to be raised you then take out and you credit uh, estimated local receipts that include things like excise, permit fees, hotel motel taxes, restaurant taxes, state aid and other sources of, it, of um, of monies, enterprise funds or free cash that offset that total amount to be raised. So if when you have those capital items that are included in that, you need to raise funds to pay for those capital items, your source of those funds is the free cash transfer. 
So those monies are not coming out of your tax monies. What's remaining after you've appropriated all that is what you call the levy, the total amount to be raised after other sources of, of money. That's where what comes from your property taxes. So just to put it in perspective for fiscal 22, the total amount to be raised for fiscal 22 is, was 129 million. 803,000 and change. The estimated receipts and other revenue sources was 46,054,897. The remaining taxes to be raised from property taxes, again, this is what the levy is, $83,748,220. So when we set a tax rate of 1849 back in November of 2021, it was in order to raise $83 million from property taxes, okay? And that's your levy. The other factor of that is pr property taxes, right? There's a number of different classifications of property tax. And this is the first step towards the process of being able to determine who pays what taxes, right? Is you need a value. The first thing you need is a total value of the town, but before you can do that, you need your assessor to set those values, to figure out what are things valued at, what are the market values. So in terms of classifications of properties, uh, the first one and the largest is residential properties. And residential properties includes more than just single family houses. Anything that is a residential property is residential, whether there's one or 300 units. Whether it's an income producing property, if it's residential, it's a residential property. If there was to be a shift in, in the levy, they would pay the residential rate. Doesn't matter how many units it is, it doesn't matter if it's income producing, residential is residential, okay? Open space, we in Westboro do not have open space. There's actually not that many communities in Massachusetts who do because of the definition of it. Our space that would be open is either in chapter um, or it is uh, vacant land, developable or undevelopable. Um, commercial property, uh, general office type hotel, recreation, um, retail, storage, things like that fall under the commercial, contrasting with industrial property, which is much more manufacturing related, um, research and development, utility, um, and companies that will work in a way to incorporate themselves into that process. So if it's an administrative office for an industrial company, typically that's not an industrial building versus a company that is part of the process of industry, even if it's shipping and receiving, um, there's some sort of industrial type. Now there are office buildings that are an industrial style based upon the use, the typical occupant of that, which is very different than your typical multi-tenanted office. Um, and the last one is personal property, which is machinery and equipment used in the conduct of business. And what falls within that class varies depend, uh, dependent upon the type of corporation it is. Um, and like with AstraZeneca, when they changed corporation status, it changed what is taxable within their company. And that can go for good and bad. If a company that is an LLC uh, that is taxable <coughs> for everything becomes incorporated, lots of their assets no longer are taxable. So we spend the year doing this research. We spend the year out there in, um, inspecting properties, figuring out what use they are, if things have changed use. We have a lot of properties lately that have gone from multi to, to single family, okay? Even though that's within the residential class, we need to categorize it properly for use. Um, it's the same thing with new construction. If we have something that went from vacant land, is it now an industrial building or did it go from commercial to industrial? So that happens throughout the year as we're visiting our properties, as we're exploring permits, as sales are happening, um, so that when we get to the time to set our values and categorize our properties, we're making sure things go into the right place. So these two things come together, the levy and the value to calculate the tax rate. So we're gonna simplify the numbers a little bit just to put it into perspective. If your total taxes to be raised were a million dollars and the levy divided by the, the what we're going to determine is the rate, which is the levy 
at how, ma how much do we need to raise per thousand to get to that. So we take a value of $100 million, it looks like I'm missing a line here, um, and we take our million dollars that we need to raise and we do that division. So we take a million dollars that needs to be raised, we divide it by the total value of the town, and we multiply by a thousand. So that's going to get you how many dollars per thousand you need to raise. And I apologize, there was one more line in there that somehow seemed to disappear. But within, you'll, we're going to get back to this example to lay it out a little cleaner um, as we go. There you go. There's the line. Total property value is $100 million. Dollars. <laughs> yeah, you know. I, yeah, it was there. You know, usually, as you know, my slides are a little blander than this. But, you, you know, people have told me that I throw up all these numbers, and I'm the only one that can see what's in those numbers, so I'm trying to break them out a little bit. Um, so here's, here's an example that will simplify things a little further. So in our example, we have a total value of the town of $100 million dollars and we have a total levy of a million dollars. And just like in our town, we have a 70% residential value and a 30% commercial, industrial, and personal property value. So 70 million in residential value, 30 million in commercial, industrial. And for the purpose of this one, we're gonna use the same valued property, okay? $500,000 property for both single family and commercial, so that you can see the impact on this as we go through. So with a single rate, you have a rate of $10, uh, $10 per thousand, and you have a tax bill of $5,000 on both sides. You have one rate, you have $100 million, and you, have, you need to raise a million dollars, right? At 10,000, uh, that gets you to a million. At $5,000 is your average tax bill. Now, when we start talking about shifting the rate, what we're really doing is shifting the levy, okay? And we're going to come back to this as we get a little further in. But what you're seeing here is it's the amount to be raised that is shifting, okay? So when you first shift here, right, you're taking 10% of what is the commercial industrial property, which is $30,000, and you're taking it away from the residential amount to be raised. So that residential amount to be raised has been reduced by $30,000. So now instead of raising $700,000, from the residential property, you're going to raise 670,000, and that 30,000 is going to go over to the other side. So, in doing so, the average property of 500,000 is going to save 214 bucks, and the average commercial of the same value, that $500,000 commercial property, is going to pay an additional $500. And the reason that is, is you're dealing with bigger numbers. So you have $700,000 in value that that $30,000 reduction is being spread out across versus the $30,000, $300,000 that it's being picked up by, okay? Which is why you have a disproportionate increase onto the commercial versus the reduction on the residential. To take it a step further, if it was a 20%, now you're shifting $60,000, right? And just to reiterate, you're shifting the percentage based upon what percent of the commercial, industrial, personal property total levy would have been raised, right? So the percentage is based upon that because you can't exceed a certain amount in terms of shifting that. So the commercial, industrial, personal property will never have to pay more than 150% of what they would have. So in this case, they were going to have to pay, raise $300,000. They will not have to, you cannot shift more than $150,000. So that being said, the $700,000 could not be reduced more than one hundred and fifty. dollars I apologize if I'm going, uh, jumping right into it. And again, one step further, 30%. So now we're shifting $90,000. So you see that 700,000 to be raised by the residential property has been reduced by to 600 by 600 to 610,000. And the increase on the commercial industrial personal property again 90,000 more to be raised by them. So they're going to get an increase on that same property of $1500 versus that same $500,000 property in a, with a residential use is going to save 643 dollars 
and you can see that that trend continues up until the 50% shift. Um, and one thing to point out here is you'll see on the right hand side where it says percent of levy in the second column, that's percent of the total levy. So it was originally 30%, the commercial industrial personal property represented 30%. And that percent they're paying of the levy is based upon their percent of the property value, right? There's a, there's a tie in there. The amount that they're going to be based on paying in taxes is based simply upon their percent of property value. With a single rate, if there's 5% commercial industrial personal property, they're gonna pay 5% of the levy, okay? It's directly tied to that. Once you start shifting is where you're taking some of the burden from the residential properties and putting it onto the commercial industrial personal properties. So in this case, what was originally 30% is now 45%. So out of that million dollars, originally the commercial industrial and personal property were paying $300,000. And now they're going to contribute $450,000. And that extra 150 has been reduced on the residential side. So you're literally shifting the taxes to be raised from one use to another. And I say one use to another because I want to reiterate the fact that it's not just your single family residential properties that benefit from this, okay? It's the residential class. So taking that one step further, if you looked at our, again, our 2022, numbers and just for the public the reason we're using 2022 numbers is those are numbers that we know right we don't know what the values are and we don't know what the total spending is going to be we haven't had october town meeting so until you know those two numbers we can't really do that math um, and so we're using known factors because we know what the 2022 numbers were okay and so these are the actual 2022 numbers i'm not going to read them in detail but we had 4.5 billion in value and we needed to raise 83.7 million and we had a split of 69.67 percent of residential class and 30.33 percent on the commercial industrial personal property side now typically when we go through this we go through with the average commercial an average residential property, right? So in this case, just st staying consistent with the $500,000 property on both sides, recognizing the fact that there aren't a lot of commercial industrial properties that fall within that category, um, but so that you can see the apples to apples side of it. Um, with the single tax rate like we had, 1849, right? They're gonna have the same tax bill. If we shift 10%, you see a $402 reduction on the residential side for that $500,000 property, and you see a $924 increase on that $500,000 commercial property. At 20%, similar, $805 decrease on the residential side and $1,849 increase on the commercial side. And as you go further out to the 30, 40, and 50%. Now, mind you, as you were, if you are considering, when people, uh, communities consider splitting, they're not tied to these round percentages. There's lots of numbers in between there. For example, for the purpose of presentation and trying to be less confusing, I'm presenting them in round numbers, but obviously there's, there's lots of numbers along the way. <coughs> So at the end of the year, we get to our classification hearing. I've set the values, um, and we'll get to what the, that timeline looks like. But when we get to the classification hearing, this is where it all comes to a head. This is where the rubber hits the road in decision time. The classification hearing is where the Board of Selectmen set the policy as to how they're going to apportion the tax levy. They do not set the tax rate. They decide how much of the levy to shift from one class to another, okay? And their first vote is whether to maintain a single rat tax rate or to shift a portion of the levy between classes. The second vote is whether to adopt what is the residential exemption. And the third vote is to whether or not to adopt a small commercial exemption. 
There is a fourth vote about an open space exemption. However, because we don't classify any property as open space, we don't act on that one. So we talk a lot about the pros and cons of shifting, right? What are the benefits? What are the uh, cons? The pros are very simple. It offers tax relief for residential property owners. We hear a lot about tax relief. This is a method to provide tax relief to residential property owners. The cons. Higher commercial taxes inhibits commercial growth. Companies considering similar locations may elect to go elsewhere. And the difficulty is people frequently want data to support this. The problem is you don't know what you don't get. If they're not going to come here, they, you don't know that they were considering coming here and they changed their mind. We do have some evidence of, of companies within my career here in 10 years that came here considering properties both here and in Marlboro. Um, and they came here, one of the reasons was because we had a lower tax rate. They pay over $100,000 in taxes every year. If you were a business and you were considering moving someplace, if you had a choice of taking on an additional $100,000 in expenses in a similar location, I think that would be one of the factors that you would consider. And it is, and they do consider it. But again, there's no way to know what you don't get. It's similar to zoning. If you don't have friendly zoning and you don't have zoning that entices people to build certain things in certain areas, you don't know who's even considering it, okay? You see other, com other companies going to other towns and you might say, hey, why didn't they come here? But who knows where they go? I mean, they consider all sorts of things. Westboro is a great location, okay? And people do choose by location for certain types of business. But there are other types of business where location is less important. If you're building an industrial property, you may, your clients aren't coming to your property. Ease of access is not always the first and foremost on your mind. As long as you are somewhat proximal to a major highway, depending on what your courier route is, it might not matter quite as much, okay? And the cost associated might matter more, okay? Um, with higher property taxes comes higher rent, okay? Property taxes are passed on to the tenants and the businesses. In many cases, in many lease scenarios, they are paying property taxes by the tenants, okay? And so that can drive up rents because the property owners are not necessarily going to eat the higher taxes. In a community that has lower taxes, they're paying less uh, common area charges. Uh, similarly, commercial higher taxes can impact the property values. It's, again, the same argument, is higher expenses can cause a decline in the value because when you value commercial properties, you're valuing a business. Someone's going to invest in that property and the revenue generated by that property. In some cases, that revenue will be driven by the rent that it can be, it can be uh, that they can absorb. And if there are higher taxes, they may not be able to charge as much in raw rent because they have to pass on the taxes or it may impact their vacancy. There's lots of different scenarios. Or there are some cases where the landlord pays the taxes, okay? And then they're taking that expense right on. Or if it's going to be owner-occupied, and they're going to have to take on that expense of taxes. Um, and then the last question is, it's allowed by law, but is it fair? You know, you'll hear a lot about uh, from commercial industrial properties that it's not fair. And so that's, uh, you know, uh, again, you get back to the policy question of taxation. Um, and no one can answer that uh, for yourselves except you. So walking through the numbers from, West, from our tax classification uh, last year, in the actual examples, looking at the realistic uh, 2.5 million of the average commercial value. And bear in mind the fact that 2.5 million is a lot of money, right? But that's an average. So that means there's ones that are much higher than that, and there's plenty of them. And then there's ones that are lower than that. And the average single family of 558,576. So again, a single rate was 1849. That 10% shift saved the commercial, uh, the residential property owner $450, but it generated a $20.33 tax rate for the commercial industrial personal property, so their bill went up $4,782.
at 20%, 899 for the savings for the residential property, $9,565 uh, for the increase in the commercial industrial property. And again, additional examples. And so here's just looking at that from a percentage standpoint. Um, the shift allowed, as I mentioned earlier, is up to 150%, okay? We've always used a single rate, and you can see the ratio of the savings to the residential average property and the cost to the commercial industrial property. And graphically, it looks like this. I know we like visuals, right? And that sort of wraps up the summary of the classification as it is for the shifting of the rate. The why we do it, the pros, the cons, and the impact relative to the actual tax savings or increase in taxes in class versus class. That, in a nutshell, is what the classification side of it is about, okay? Getting to the two exemptions that are discussed. The residential exemption has certain criteria. As it says here, only 15 of 351 communities adopt this residential exemption. The, what they all have in common is they all either have lots of second homes or lots of investment properties. One of the requirements of a residential exemption is it must be the primary residence, okay? And so when you have lots of investment properties, multifamilies, you have lots of properties that don't qualify for the residential exemption. When you have lots of second homes, they don't qualify either. So here's an opportunity for them to give a benefit in Nantucket, for example, to the property owners that actually live in Nantucket um, versus the ones that have their second homes there. So in looking at this, okay, when we look at it from a, how many properties in town could qualify for this, I don't have, I don't track how many are owner occupied and how many are private, uh, are primary residences. I don't know that information. So when I come up with this 4,870 properties, I'm simply looking at a property type that could qualify for this exemption if it would fall into this category, okay? The maximum you could shift is 35% of the average residential property value. Now. What's different between this and the other shift is this is a value shift, okay? So you're literally shifting value within the residential class away from certain people that will be paid by other people. And I'll get to the example as to what that means shortly, okay? But by doing that, it creates a natural break point. So it's going to create a higher residential rate because the residential properties still need to raise the same amount of the levy, okay? So in that initial example, when they had to raise $700,000, they still need to raise $700,000 from the residential property. But now what you're doing is you're exempting a certain amount from each property. So each property out of that 4,870 properties that are going to receive an exemption will get a reduction in value. But yet the total amount to be raised stays the same from the residential class. None of this involves the commercial, industrial, or personal property, okay? And so some owners are gonna receive a benefit, okay? Uh, that are gonna be paid for by others. It creates a natural break point because at some point, the savings opportunity from someone who lives, in this case, in a house over 648,807. So if I live in a $700,000 house and you do the math, I might get a break on my value, but because you're using a higher multiple, a higher rate, my taxes are going up anyways. So even though you've lowered my value by the exemption amount, the amount to make up for the total lowered value is going to create a higher residential rate, so I'm gonna be paying for that tax break that's going to other taxpayers. One of the things that's different compared to other statutory exemptions we have is this exemption, the, the sole qualifications are that it's your primary residence. There is no income or asset requirements. 
there's no test for income or assets. So you could have someone who has a second home, either in Westboro or in Florida. They could have three homes. You know, they can live in a small house and have downsized and have, you know, very high income. And they're going to get a break on their taxes at the cost of other property owners. Okay. And so just looking at your, where that falls, uh, this is the curve of where the property values are that fall within this. So that mark, that 648,900 was the next one up over the 648,807. So the property owners to the left, all those property owners will qualify for the exemption because their property is worth less. And the, prop the property owners to the right are going to pay for that. So there's about 1,000 property owners that would pick up relative to whatever exemptions would be granted. So here's just an example of the math. The average residential value, and just to point out, that's not the average single family value, that's the residential value. So that includes all residential properties, okay? And that's the average of those values. At 10%, it's $56,097. And so if you took the eligible number of properties and you multiplied it by 56,097, you get that 273 million. So as an individual property owner, if my house was valued at $500,000 and there was a 10% exemption, I would reduce my value by $56,097 if I received this exemption. Okay, so now I would be taxed on 443,000, 444,000 change. Um, and so if the total residential was 3.15 million and we took out that 273 that we are exempting, that leaves us with 2.882 million. Billion, thank you, Leah. Uh, <laughs> um, and so we're gonna still raise the same amount of money, but now with a lower number, okay? So in this case, in 2022, they needed to raise $58 million. And that $58 million, instead of being divided by the $3.15 billion, it's going to be divided by the $2.88 billion to get an adjusted tax rate of $20.24. So as in last year, the commercial industrial rate is still going to be $18.49 if we were to maintain a single rate, but now the residential rate would be $20.24. And here's just a couple examples. If you use the average single family, they would benefit by $157.91. A higher valued property at $900,000, it will cost them $439.59. And a lower valued property, if their property was valued at $350,000, they'd receive a bigger benefit um, of $522.91. So Jonathan, just, yep. sorry. Um, we can jump in with questions here. That's fine. Um, so that now a residential taxpayer that doesn't qualify for this exemption, so it's a second home, um, they would still pay the higher rate, the 2024, at their original value. Is that? They would, they would pay the higher rate at their original value. Because yes. they don't get the reduction right. in value. Right. But one of the reasons that that's done more frequently in properties that have a high number of rental properties or second homes is because you have, you would have less properties within Westboro that are not owner occupied essentially. Um, do they exist? Absolutely. I mean, let's face it, there's lots of multifamilies and other properties. There's lots of single families and condos that aren't their primary residence. So those properties would not uh, qualify, but primarily the vast majority of properties in Westboro are owner occupied. John, uh, regarding the, you said in the beginning when we were talking about residential exemptions that that's not, you know, the, the 4,800, um, um, 70 homes is based on the um, the property type. So it's just an estimate. So you don't, it's not something you're tracking now in terms of who would qualify. Correct. Can you give us a sense of, and maybe you can't hear, but um, what would that take for your department? And, and there must be a process, right? So people have to apply annually. I do recall yep. that. Yep. Um, and does ev so 
you have to ask for, I guess the first question is a, a, a homeowner would have to ask for the exemption? They have to ask for the exemption, they apply. It's, you're really attesting to the fact that it is your primary residence. We're not going out and knocking on the door. Yep. Um, Checking when they're sleeping at night They're signing away yeah. and stating as a fact yep. that they are attesting to the fact that that is their primary residence. Okay. And just um, given your line of work, um, would, is there any way to estimate how many of the 4,800 potentially could apply here in Westboro? I'm just trying to think of even attestations, what kind of work volume that creates for your department. Um, and the cost of that, right? So there's, yeah, there's so, so there might the, be savings to some, but there could be additional yeah, it's, costs. It's a, it's a substantial number. You know, I mean, it's thousands of properties that would qualify. Right. Um, would there be a way to probably give some guesstimate? Probably if I mm -hmm. cross-referenced with the voter records and sort of did one of those comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, relative to the annual, uh, there are communities that don't require it annually. Um, whether or not they're supposed to, I, my understanding is that they are. Yep. Um, relative to the rights of other taxpayers, if they're not requiring annually, right. you know, if they're not still not their residential primary residence, then you know mm -hmm. they're skating. So I, I don't know that I would go that route. Sure. Um, but I guess to get back to the workload, it'd be substantial. I mean, there'd be, you know, but to be honest, there are plenty of people that wouldn't bother with it. You know, there are plenty of people who, who frankly, amazingly enough, there's lots of things. Sure. You know, they don't get asked for excise abatements. There's, right. you know, people put priorities in yeah. different places. Okay, thank so. you. First of all, John, thank you for doing all the work to pull this together and certainly all the information you provided to us beforehand. It was very helpful. Um, I think a similar question to Shelby's perhaps is um, these numbers represent, I think, an all-in, meaning all 4,800 residents that are eligible apply and therefore the increase um, on the average high-value single-file uh, uh, single property property would go up to 439 that's the max that it would hit in, in that well, example for that property size it's property value is that correct? that's actually not the max because this is only with the 10 percent shift right so but I mean, under yes this, under this scenario. under this scenario that is based upon the worst case scenario so in theory if only 20 uh let's say 20 percent or make it easy 50 percent of the people out of those 4,800 homes don't apply for it then that number 439 would drop in half in theory Something like that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So, I, th I think it's important we talk about this exemption. We use the term landowner or property owner, not homeowner, mm -hmm. because it covers all residential properties. And while condos are owner occupied, apartment stock isn't. If, if you have a, if it, so I, I assume if I own a building that has 10 apartments in it, even if I live in one of the 10 apartments, it's not considered owner-occupied. Um, correct, over a certain amount. Over you know, a certain amount. Yes. And so I, I also think it's safe to assume that a 10-unit apartment building has a higher valuation than the average single-family home. Well, the only thing I would say, well, just relative that. to the number of properties, I did not include those multifamily properties in that no, no, but, but my, I understand. My, my, point is they're not, my point is they're not eligible for the exemption, Correct. which means they're going to pay the higher tax rate on their full Original value. Full value. Correct. So our, excuse me, our housing demographics, particularly around apartments in Westboro, are skewed to larger buildings, eight or ten, or you know, the vast majority of our apartments are in large complexes. Actually, so I guess my concern, the side effect of this exemption is knowing that those properties won't qualify for the exemption, and if the rate goes from 18.6 to 20.2, that's a, roughly about a 20% increase in the property taxes that, that, that those larger apartment complexes are gonna pay, that cost will get passed on to the tenants and we'll see increased rents. Yeah, they would get hit pretty hard by this. They get yeah. hit pretty yeah. hard. And it would make apartments even less affordable, potentially. 
or I, w I guess I would expect that. So yeah, I wouldn't expect the can, can landlord to can, pay to, to eat, to eat that. that back. Can we just clarify a point though? At the very beginning of the presentation, you had mentioned that all residential property, regardless, is residential property. So Correct. clarify, explain to me what Alan is saying. I want so to understand. All residential property are going to pay the residential rate, right? So with this shift, you're taking property value away from the owner occupied property. Okay, but that residential total residential class still needs to raise the same amount of money. Okay, so you're shifting value away from all those properties, but you still need to raise the same amount. So it's going to generate a higher tax rate. So the higher tax rate, okay, is going to apply to a apartment building that's worth $53 million. And so at $53 million, when you add $3 to the tax rate, it's a big hit. Yeah. And so the point is really, I think, if I understand, Alan, is that that shift has a more substantial impact on those larger property owners as well, you know, relative to how similar to a, sh a split or something like that would impact commercial industrial properties. So we're not setting, in those large occupancy buildings we're not setting the taxes based on unit it's on the total property well no the value value is a different story so the tax rate is based upon use simply what it's used for you live in it it's a residential property right but it's, it's but they wouldn't qualify because they're right. not owner owner occupied like within the subgroup so it's like residential yeah, right. and then the subgroup but, right. under, understand one thing is their valuation model is based upon number of units. So they're $53 million for a reason, right? Yeah. They're $53 million because there's 346 units in there, right. okay? And their model of valuation is based upon what a buyer would consider. A buyer is going to consider the income generated by that. So even you're talking about an income property, it's a residential income property. Does that change with a condominium where the, where the where the resident is the owner of the condominium. Yes, yes. Most of our condominiums would qualify for this. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I guess my point is I'm concerned that if this shifts burden to multi-family rental units, the demographics of the residents of those are actually are more likely lower income than some of the single-family homeowners who would be receiving the benefit. And you might actually be shifting tax, effectively shifting the tax burden mm -hmm. to lower income households from upper income households because they in rent a larger complex rather than owning a single family. In an unintended way. In an yes. unintended way, right, unintended way. So it's, I, I always worry about yeah. the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so it's. Yeah, and bear in mind that there's no qualification other than living in the property. So you're also giving a, a tax benefit to someone who may not need it. There might be someone in a property that's sick, worth $649,000 that they bought for $30,000 a long time ago, and they can't necessarily afford to move, and the only reason their property is worth $649,000 is because they live in Westboro, and it's a desirable place to be. But they may be house poor, right? And they can't afford that increase. But yet the person who downsized, who doesn't need the benefit, is getting a benefit. Again, there's a reason why the, so, few, so many communities that have a larger base that absorb this because it affects that break-even point. Which, if I may, was a question that I, I posed to you in an email. And, and if you don't have the answer now, or but perhaps something to, to, to bring to the table later, um, are there any other options for um, exemptions that the town is allowed to, to establish by vote? Yeah, so I'll, I could send you an email. I did a presentation a few years ago about statutory exemptions in the town of Westboro, not to go down this path, but does everything possible within the current statutory and above and beyond, right down to a 0% interest deferral program. And the Senior Taxation Relief Committee will be bringing forward a uh, warrant article in October um, hopefully that you will support that will be for a home rule petition for a, another exemption so that we can continue our work towards, you know, finding alternate ways to do that based upon means and income and assets. Great. John, I'm just looking at our time and we're slightly over, but I know you have more here, so. Well, the small commercial exemption uh, shouldn't take too long. 
Um, one of the questions was, when do we determine this? There are 45 properties that we estimate might be eligible. So these are commercial properties only, class three, not industrial properties. They must be valued under a million dollars. All tenants within that must have 10 employees or less. Um, the maximum reduction they can receive is 10% of value. Um, it, again, to be shifted within, in this case, the commercial industrial properties. And the way we identify that is we get a list from the Department of Labor. We get it sometime late summer or in September. And that's when we go out and we do our, our research. We go through the list. We eliminate all the properties that are industrial. We eliminate all the properties over a million dollars. And then we go out and do boots on the ground and we take a look. Because it needs to be all the businesses within there and not the DOT does, uh, DOL does not report 100% of businesses. Um, so that's where we come up with the 45 properties. They would need to apply. And this exemption is one that goes on the real estate. There is no requirement that the property owner pass this on to the tenants. Because they are lower valued properties, typically these are the ones where the owner pays the taxes, not the tenants. Um, and so this is a property, uh, this is an exemption that really goes to the property owners. There's only 14 communities of the 351 that have adopted it. Um, and just to touch on the timeline, um, as I mentioned, throughout the year, we're going through and doing our permit inspections and sales inspections. Each year, the valuation effective date is January 1st. So for 2020, fiscal 22, it was January 1st of 21. For fiscal 23, it will be January 1st of 22. So the sales analysis will use 2021 sales for fiscal 23. And that's important to remember, all those properties that are selling next door to you, those will be fiscal 24 sales. Um, and then one of the deadlines to be aware of is our June 1st deadline, which is the assessing deadline. It's our office's deadline for really having all of our preliminary work done. So we do our best to capture um, construction along the way to capture for the preliminary bills, and that's our first deadline for capturing improvements. And then our actual deadline for new construction is June 30th, okay? Um, June 30th, while June, January 1st is the deadline for assessment dates, June 30th is the deadline for improvement. So if there's new construction like Pulte, for example, we walk every floor of a building that's under construction and we evaluate its percent complete and we apply that as a reduction on its value. And then when they get a CO, when it's complete, they get an apportioned supplemental bill. So they get, do get a bill from the date of the CO until the end of the fiscal year, provided that the value goes up over a certain percent. Um, the sales analysis, Okay, starts really at the summertime. As soon as I'm done with the abatement period and I'm done with our getting ready for our billing, um, come now is when I really try to get into the um, sales. You, my staff has been going out and evaluating the sales. We're making sure that we've got inspections and evaluating them to make sure that we can then do the sales analysis. Okay, we can capture our growth through our permit entering Okay, and all that comes to a head in October and November. Okay, the final values are set usually just after October town meeting, um, as well as once we have that total spending and we know what our levy is, we can then work to finalize the classified values, get them signed off on, and get a certified rate. Typically, the classification hearing this has been in and around. Uh, Thanksgiving, um, usually the meeting right before it so that we get back from Thanksgiving, I can uh, work with Leah and we can get a tax rate set. Um, and that's the general timeline as to what happens through the year. Um, and I'll have this available to you after that gives you sort of the range of the reporting in the sign offs and authorizations that happen through the state um, with one of the key dates being that town meeting date because in order to really understand, you need two things. You need values to be done so that you know what your values are, and you need your, your levy to be done. Um, and those are the two things. If our values come in higher and our levy comes in lower, it's all good. If our levy comes in higher, you know, if we need to raise more money 
it's, uh, it's pretty binary. Taxes go up. Great. Thank you. Um, I think as we started with this for the board, I mean, if there's any remaining questions right now, quick ones, but we do tentatively have a um, hold for an August meeting to have follow-up if we need it. What I would suggest is if there's follow-up questions, send them through Christy, then we can determine whether that, that meeting um, for us is necessary. There is the, definitely the plan, though, to bring this out to a more public forum in September. But for us as a board, um, this was great. But if there are follow-on questions um, that you come up with or think about over the next um, couple of weeks, uh, get that through Christy, and then she can we can coordinate um, putting this on another agenda in August if we need to. Let me ask a clarifying question yep. just on the, um, this was one of my questions to you, John, in, in the email. Just can you clarify the um, like improvements? I understand new construction. Yeah, so what you were referring to there was that, that um, segment out of the new growth is mm -hmm. what can be considered new growth in that section as it's counted so that improvements if someone renovates a bathroom if someone does an addition those are things that generate new growth yep. the other adjustments the market adjustments the analysis adjustments or adjustments based upon data tables those go into the valuation okay, okay? but that section you were grabbing from yep. was all about new growth okay. and so we are very clear and when i provide the numbers to the state have to delineate what is new growth mm -hmm. and what is um what is uh, adjusted values based upon the market and okay. and the adjusted values come in two phases it's getting my sales approved and then adjusting the total town value so there's a couple steps there great any final questions perfect jonathan thank you very much well thank you i hope i didn't uh jump into it too much but i hope you took away a li little bit of a better understanding of what happens when you shift and where that comes from and goes great thank you a lot to digest but this is uh this is great and as christy said this was the goal of the select board also the goal that we gave to christy so christy thanks for organizing leah and john thanks for your work here and uh definitely more to come